Good evening. Welcome to our third Lifting Up Early Childhood event. My name is Betty Cones. I'm the Executive Director for Reba Early Learning Center located in Evanston, Illinois. Reba is one of over 40 partners in the Lifting Up Early Childhood Collaborative. Our first event was held last November around the documentary, No Small Matter. Our second event was held this past February with Dr. Jeff Nagel from the Erickson Institute. We focused on the first 1100 days of a child's life. We were due to have our third event in April focusing on advocacy and action steps, but due to COVID-19, we were unable to do that event in person. We are happy to bring to you tonight our third event around advocacy and action steps. Hello, my name is Stephen Vick and I'm the Executive Director of the Infant Welfare Society of Evanston. We're really excited to have you with us tonight. It's going to be an incredible conversation. We've brought together some wonderful groups of people to talk about the intersectionality of race, social justice, and early childhood. The partnership that has brought this to you involves the Evanston Early Childhood Council, the Early Childhood Alliance from Skokie Morton Grove, Evanston Cradle to Career, the Evanston Community Foundation, and the Erickson Institute. Good evening. My name is Rose Ness Shriver. I'm the Early Childhood Resource Specialist for the Early Childhood Alliance and the Evanston Early Childhood Council. Our topics for today's event include the expulsion rate for Black males in early childhood, the impact of racism on social and emotional development, and early childhood workforce, including low wages and high expectations. Thank you for joining us this evening. I would like to go ahead and introduce our moderator for this event, Dr. Christina Pestioni Zayas, the Associate Vice President of Policy for the Erickson Institute. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Christina Passioni Sayas, Associate Vice President of Policy at Erickson Institute in Chicago. Thank you for joining us tonight for this critical conversation where we're going to explore the intersections between early childhood and systemic racism. Now, you might be wondering how we're going to draw these connections, and you are in for a treat because we have some experts joining us tonight that specifically focus on child development, restorative justice, early care and education and of course, systemic racism. But before we get started, I wanna make sure that everyone kind of has some basic knowledge around child development. And that is that the first five years of life are the most important for setting the life course. This is because 90% of the brain is developed during this period. And that brain is working in overtime Essentially, you've got billions of neural connections that are firing off every single second to form the foundational architecture of the brain structure. And this will set the course for the life journey. So during this period, key development is occurring in the areas of language, physical growth, social emotional development, and cognitive development. Ultimately, you should understand that early experiences matter and that children learn in the context of relationships. And this is because they experience the world around them through relationships and specifically the relationship between the child and the primary caregiver or the parent or the guardian is key. And that specific relationship is situated in a family dynamic. Those family dynamics have cultural traditions. They ultimately are situated in a community. That community is situated in a village, a town, a city. That though the city, town, and village may be situated in a larger geography. And that larger geography has certain policies at a state level and then the policies at a national level. This is all to illustrate that there are multiple influences that eventually come forward to influence the development of a child and to construct the conditions, the circumstances, and ultimately the choices that are offered to that particular child and their primary caregiver. So I want to transition us to our key interview with Jane Elliott. You all may have seen Jane Elliott before because she is most famous for her exercise that she did with her third graders in 1968 
in the aftermath of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What she really wanted to drive home to these third graders is the impact of malicious treatment based on your physical appearance. Because she had a classroom full of all white children, she obviously couldn't do it by skin color. So what she did was treat them differently based on eye color. Since then, she has been famous across the globe for her approach to really upending systemic racism, promoting a very different way of thinking about race and ultimately compelling us to do something about it. Let's meet Jane. This is a special week. Does anybody know what it is? National, National Brotherhood. Brotherhood. National Brotherhood Week. What's brotherhood? Be kind to your brothers. Be, be kind okay, to be your kind to your brothers. Like you, you would like to be treated. Treat everyone the way you would like to be treated. Treat everyone as though he was your brother. brother. And is there anyone in this United States that we do not treat as our brothers? Yes. Who? Yes. The, black the, black black the black people. Who else? In Absolutely, the Indians. And when you see, when many people see a black person or a yellow person or a red person, what do they think? Uh, oh, look at that. Dumb people. And look at the dumb people. What else do they think sometimes? What kinds of things do they say about black people? Oh, uh, they're niggers, niggers. In the city, many places in the United States. How are black people treated? How are Indians treated? How are people who are of a different color than we are treated? Like they, like like they are part of this place. world. They don't get anything in this world. So Why is that? Because they're different color. You think you know how I would feel yeah. to be judged by the color of your skin? Yeah. I don't. Do you think you do? No, I don't think you'd know how that felt unless you had been through it, would you? <laughs> It might be interesting to judge people today by the color of their eyes. Would you like to try this? Yeah. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? So for me, I think uh, as while I was an undergraduate and then graduate school studying sociology and educational policy studies, your exercise that you did in your third grade class in 1968 was certainly um, a project that we studied in our field. Um, we were well aware of what uh, you were trying to do and accomplish. Um, and obviously it's a reference point in a lot of educational institutions. Tell us what inspired you to conduct this exercise. Desperation. I had no way to explain to my all white, nine year old, all Christian third graders in Riceville, Iowa, why anyone would want to kill a man like Martin Luther King Jr. I could not describe for them the environment and the atmosphere in their community because it would have made them hate their community, and they should, if that's the environment. So I had to do something that would give them the opportunity to walk in the shoes of another person. We were going to learn the Sioux Indian prayer the next day that says, oh great spirit, keep me from ever judging a man until I've walked a mile in his moccasins. I decided that I was going to give my third graders the opportunity to walk in the shoes of a child of color in the United States of America for one day. And I decided to base my, the, the thing we were going to use to decide who was good or who was bad on eye color, because that's what Adolf Hitler used during the Holocaust. One of the ways they decided who went into the gas chamber or whose children were thrown up in the air and shot at was eye color. If you had a good German name, but you had brown eyes, they thought you might be a Jewish person was trying to pass. And that's one of the ways they decided who to kill and who to incarcerate. Hmm. And what were the reactions of your students? I mean, they were, like you said, nine years old, third grade, um, still young. At, and from an early childhood perspective, they're at the end of that early childhood continuum. How did they respond and react? But you see, when you talk about early childhood and you say at this age they won't and this age that they won't, you need to realize that in this country, we start discriminating against children pre-birth. We don't wait until they're nine years old. We, can, we discriminate against those who have their own color parents or their own color skin from the moment before they're born until after they die. So this isn't a new experience for children. This was a new experience for white children. 
We don't generally do this with white children. I wanted my white children to find out something about what it's like to be other than white in the United States of America. No matter what your, what your color is, no matter what your age is, we have a way we treat those who aren't good and those who, way we treat those who aren't bad. And you want to remember that every one of these little kids probably has been exposed to the idea of the rightness of whiteness and the wrongness of blackness. Because in this country, in the English language, white is about goodness and black is about savagery and ugliness. And that's what we teach in everything we do. The, you know, the cowboys have, the good cowboys wear white hats and the bad cow cowboys wear black hats. And we know that black means bad and white means good. If you start that pre-birth, how do you expect kids to come to school not being, having been indoctrinated with that nonsense? So when we separate kids into white and black, we're doing once again the thing that we shouldn't do in early childhood ed. Every, every, certainly every kindergarten teacher this fall should hand every one of those kids a box of Crayola crayons and say, now I want you all to take out the one that looks like this. This is white. Put it against the back of your hand. Will every child whose skin matches this color, please raise your hand. Nobody's gonna raise their hand because none of those kids are white. And you can do the same thing with the black crayon. None of those kids are gonna have skins that are black. People don't come in white and black. We come in shades of brown. And we need to have the Pantone color wheel on the wall and have each of those kids go up and put your hand on the color wheel where it matches the color of your hand. Those kids have a right to know that we are all members of the same race and we are all shades of brown. We'd better start teaching that instead of talking about black and white in the schools. Because when you talk about black and white, you are talking about polar opposites. White guys are the good guys, black guys are the evil. You know the difference between good and evil. So stop using those two terms to describe children. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. I mean, I think that also too, over the past couple decades, we've learned a lot with respect to how young children can not only recognize the distinctions or just the physical distinctions of race, um, but also develop racial biases by the time that they're ages three to five that may or may not match with the adults around them. But ultimately, race is a social construct. We know that- Wait, a that minute. wait, 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 wait a damn minute. I am sick and tired of hearing people say race is, a, race is a social construct. What race is, is a damn lie. Now let's stop using multi multisyllabic words in order to describe something that's pretty simple. Race isn't a social construct, it is a damn lie. And it was, we created it during the Spanish Inquisition. Before that, color wasn't a problem. But after that, because Torquemada and company had to find a new way to identify who they should kill, they couldn't tell what your religion was by looking at you. So at that point, they decided they'd use skin color to decide who it was all right to kill. That's when this whole thing started. And that's only between five and 600 years ago. This is something we could have stopped immediately if we had chosen to. We have chosen not to because race is the moneymaker in the United States of America. And it's not a social construct, it's an anti-social construct. But it makes such, it sounds so good to call it a social construct. We sound so worldly and so educated when we say that. We don't wanna call it what it is, which is a lie. And it's time for us to stop telling the lie. Sorry, I don't want to offend you, but we, I get really impatient with using words, words are the most powerful weapon devised by humankind. We need to use them more carefully. Just a minute. I'm busy right now. I'll call back later, please. Thank you. <laughs> no, no offense taken. I, I, I appreciate the, the directness with how, you know, sometimes you're right. We use these flowery words to really obscure what we really mean. Um, and and ultimately, you know, you're right in terms of what the what race and, and this kind of figment of our imagination has been used. I'm curious because um, there's a lot of discussion um, in, in the education space in early childhood around bias. And I'm wondering about your experience um, as an educator and what are your thoughts on the impact of bias or educators' discomfort with addressing racism directly and how that specifically affects early childhood development? I think that's not about bias, that's about ignorance. And I think anyone who is going to be working with children has to have to realize that those kids are going to come to school having heard 
probably racist remarks in their environment. If they watch television, they've heard racist remarks. If they if they listen to their parents visiting, they've heard racist remarks. If they listen to their parents on the television, on the telephone, they've heard racist remarks. They come to school with racism built in. Now, they weren't born a racist. Nobody's born a bigot. There is no gene for bigotry. There is uh, the absolute truth that kids become what they what they experience. And so they come to school saying the same kinds of things that their parents do and with the same kinds of ideas without ever having my third graders had never been in the company of a person of color. But when I asked them that first time, what do you kids know about black people? They knew every negative stereotype I had ever heard and some that I had never heard. And I finally said, look, how do you kids know these things are true? And they said, because my dad said so. Now somebody has to tell these parents and you know, they'll send a letter to the parents and say, here's the way it is. Your teacher this year, your, your, student, your child this year has a teacher who is going to instruct your child so that he or she will not tolerate racist remarks being made in their presence. You need to know that that's part of education in the system. We are trying to educate our children away from bias and away from racism because it's hard on everyone, just as hard on the white kids as it is on the kids of other color groups because white people never know what to say because nobody has told them, look, here are the things you do not say, period. And one of the things you don't call people is different colors, unless you've got a color, a name off the color wheel. It's time for us to start acting like educators instead of like teachers or indoctrinators. It's time for us to start educating children to the truth that there's only one race and you're all shades of brown. Tell me this, um, you know, because you mentioned the, the human race and, and oftentimes um, you are described as a pro-human rights advocate. Um, what, what led you to develop that position? What experiences did you have, um, whether it be formal education or lived experiences that kind of brought you to this awareness? It was perfectly obvious to me that I have seen members of different color groups mate and reproduce and have beautiful children because we're all members of the same species. And that's homo sapien. Now you can't cross a cat with a dog and get a dad or a cog because they're different species. But you cross people of different color groups and get beautiful, brilliant children. If we weren't able to do that, there would be a whole lot of people not, not living today because people have been doing that for thousands of years before the Spanish Inquisition. It was all right, but suddenly, all of a sudden, we decided that because of religion, we couldn't do that anymore. We have laws in this country and have had, and there still are some states in, where there are, which, in which there are laws against miscegenation. You can't marry a person out of your race. Well, that's a lot of barn dirt because there is no person on the face of the earth who is out of my race. We are all members of the same race. It's time to get over that nonsense because it's based on skin color. Different color, different faces are not different races. The human race comes in a multitude of colors, but it all we all came from the same modern human beings that evolved in sub-Saharan Africa between 300,000 and 500,000 years ago. And if you don't believe that, then you get the April 2018 edition of the National Geographic magazine. I, I challenge everyone who's watching this to get a copy of this magazine. If you can't, if you don't want to order it, go to the library and get a copy of this magazine. See these two girls on the front of this magazine? Their parent, their father is black and their mother is white. So would you call these girls biracial? You might have done that yesterday. You won't ever do it again. I'm busy, right. call me later. They're human. You might have done that yesterday. You'll never do that again because they're human, but they aren't biracial. Call them mosaic. A mosaic is an art form that is new and unique and beautiful and made of many different elements. That's what these girls are. And if you want a name for what they are, what they're what they are as members of the human race is mosaic. There's absolutely, absolutely no justification in calling them different races. And if you don't believe that, then you look at this part, this map in this magazine. This shows where modern human beings started and how they moved to inherit, in, to, in, to populate every landmass on the face of the earth. Every human being living on the face of the earth today is a descendant of those first modern human beings. And the only reason we don't all have very dark skin is because as they moved farther and farther from the equator, they're exposed to less and less sunlight. So their skin, their hair, and their eyes got lighter. They didn't get dumber. They didn't get brighter. They just got lighter. 
So get over it. They were all members of the same race. We are all members of the same race. And if we would all check, have our DNA checked, take it back, trace it back as far as we could trace it, every one of us would find that there is a percentage of our DNA that came from a country in Africa. That's the way it is. Get over the rest of this nonsense. Start living with the facts instead of the fantasy that white people have constructed. And the members of Torquemada's group were not white. They were shades of brown too, just like all the rest of us are. They were white, but they came up with white because it's the word for good and black is the word for evil. Right on. I'm curious, um, you know, for, for all of that that you just kind of presented, obviously there's a science behind it. Um, there's a, a history telling all of that. What, what, are, what are some ways, what are some strategies that we can ensure that this information gets integrated into our schooling, into our education system? Um, because what you speak to in terms of, you know, whiteness is good, blackness is not, that has, there's all those kinds of messages all throughout our education system. And I'm just wondering, like, if from the standpoint of an educator, an administrator, a policymaker, how do we begin to really get at that root, that root cause there? You have to educate the educators. Because unless I'm mistaken, you weren't taught that Abraham Lincoln was part black, part white, and part Cherokee Indian, were you? Mm -mm. Well, no. he was. He was. You need to know that. There are lots of things that you weren't taught because they didn't fit the white right message. We need to start telling the truth, but that means educating the educators. And we have to educate the people who write the laws. And if you think I'm wrong about that, read the book, The Color of Law. And you will find out that the law, the people who wrote the laws that made that uh, made made segregation legal, wrote laws because they believed in the myth of several races. They didn't know any better, and the people in Congress and in the House of Representatives and the Senate today don't know any better. They will continue to write laws that segregate people and that are unfair to people because they really still believe in the rightness of whiteness. Nobody has educated them for the last 30 or 40 years. And what, you, what we were telling people 15, 20, 30 years ago was wrong. It's time to start telling the truth. Read the book, The Myth of Race by Robert Wald Sussman, and then you'll know why we need to put a stop to this nonsense. And it is nonsense. There's only one race. You and I are 30th to 50th cousins because we have the same ancestor back there 300,000 to 500,000 years ago. And he didn't look like me. And you can see the color of my shirt, it's white. You can see where my skin starts and my shirt stops because this ain't white. My hair is white, my shirt is white, my skin is speckled, but it's shades of brown, it is not white. We've got to get over this idea. We're cre we create cognitive dissonance in kids when we bring them to school and say, you're white and you're black. Oh, good Lord when the teacher's standing up there and she's tan or brown or has a pinkish cast to her skin, but she isn't white. Mm -hmm. And most of the kids aren't black. They're very dark brown, but they are black. So, so tell me this. So obviously you're, you're naming that, you know, we need to kind of address ignorance. We need to really think about the education piece. What are those, what are the barriers to us transforming education to eradicate white supremacy and 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 all of the the different nasty kind of arms that come out of it the barriers are right now the fact that people of darker skin color melan melanaceous people if you have if you don't have enough iron in your blood you have anemia you're anemic right if you don't have enough melanin in your skin to give your skin enough color then you must be melanemic Melanemic people, melanemic is a nice word for white. Melanemic people are going to hang on to their whiteness as long as they possibly can. And black children, black students, black and black um, teenagers are going to hold on to black as long as they possibly can because nobody has sat down with them and said, look, they set you up for failure by calling you black, which means evil, and those folks white, which means good. Now, what you have to do is realize that you're all shades of brown and refuse to let somebody else define you by telling you that your skin is black when it isn't. 
I know there is a, I know there's black culture in this country. That culture is wonderful. It's rich. It's beautiful. It is, it is so full of so many good things. But you see, what you're dealing with is people who have all their lives been told that they were precious because they were pale faces. And you don't dare call them pale faces. And you don't dare call them faded, because that's all we are is faded black folks. So you have to give them a name that makes sense. And melanemic for white people makes sense because they are, they lack melanin. Those who have a lot of melanin could be called melanaceous. There's nothing, there's nothing positive or negative about either one of them. They're scientific terms. I never heard of them before, but I made them up and I think we should use them. You have <laughs> more melanin, you have more melanin in your skin than I have. But on places on my skin, I have more melanin. So you see, part of me is melanemic, this over here. This part is melanaceous. It's ridiculous. It's a skin color. Let's get over it. And I'm just curious too, in terms of, you know, from when you first did that exercise with your third graders to where we're at today, do you, how would you characterize the difference, if any, in the state of affairs in our society? We are in worse shape today because of the past three and a half years than we were in 1968. Because in 1968, the civil rights movement was in full swing. Now we have leadership that says there's no racism in this country. And our leader says he isn't a racist. And when he first did a press conference, he said, see, I've got my black right over there. And he pointed at the one black person in the room. But he isn't a racist, you understand. And I don't see color, but he isn't a racist, you understand. We have the kind of encouragement of racism today that we haven't had for a very long, for a very long time. Since the 1950s, we haven't had this kind of blatant, open racism. Right now, it's all right to be a racist. If it isn't all right to be a racist, you have to explain to me why we have allowed someone to put up a wall on the border of the on the southern border of the United States in order to, as he has said, keep those brown skinned people out because brown skinned people reproduce too rapidly. That's called racism. And we've allowed that to happen. And the reason we allowed it to happen is because about a 30, 33% of the population of the United States firmly believes in the myth of race and the idea that white skin means you're brighter. It's a lie. We're going to have to teach these parents. We're going to have to force parents to bite the bullet and realize that skin color is not an indication of your intelligence or your worth as a human being. It is simply your body's reaction to the natural environment. That's all skin color is. Can you speak a little bit too as well as a, as a melanemic woman, um, if you can speak to like you delivering this message is received different from a melanaceous woman. And, and can you talk about how you've been able to navigate that from your standpoint about how you look on the outside. I know why I'm allowed to do this. If I had been a black woman in that classroom and had done that blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, I would have lost my job and I might have lost my life. I am allowed to do these things and say these things because I'm white. So nobody's going to, I've been threatened with death lots of times. I get calls in the night, oh my goodness, and I hear the things they want to do to me and I think, well, that sounds kind of interesting, but maybe maybe another time I, I have gotten letters that would burn the paper if they weren't if it wasn't written on asbestos i've been they took me out of uniontown pennsylvania at midnight three carloads of blacks did because of the fact that the teachers that i put through the exercise in a very informal way called the superintendent in the afternoon and said if you don't get that bitch out of town we're going to shoot her and the blacks knew that they were serious so they got me out of town they i worked in in uh, uniontown the next day accompanied all the time by a black man because he said you're not going to be alone while you're in uniontown i thought oh come on give me a break well they would not leave me alone and then that night this was the night after i did the exercise with the teachers they got me out of uniontown pennsylvania i wasn't supposed to go until the next morning but they said we're going now you can threaten me with anything you want to but you can't stop the idea of one race it is an idea whose time has come somebody said and i can't remember the name now Nothing can stop an, a man with a dream or an idea whose time has come. 
Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream. You couldn't stop it. His dream is more alive now than it was when he was living. Nothing is going to be able to stop the idea of one race. It's the truth. Eventually, people will realize if we want the human race to survive, we have to start acting like humans and start acting like reasonable people who can learn and who don't, do not have to believe the lie that we have been taught for between five and 600 years. Yes, thank you. That, um, you, you, uh, you've certainly summed up the whole piece. I mean, like I said, you have given the scientific explanation. You have obviously given the social and moral imperative. I'm, I'm curious about, you know, you've been at this now um, for 50 plus years, if not longer. What keeps you going? Racism. All you have to do to shut me off is stop acting like racists. I'd be perfectly happy to sit here in this house or sit in my house in California and do nothing but embroider, knit, crochet, listen to good music, think about the man that I left, that I lost, I, he, he died. Think about that and how lucky I'll be when I get to see him sometime again. That would be much, much easier than what I'm doing. I'd love to be able to do that. What are the markers that tell you that you are having some type of progress made with what you have been trying to put out? Those protesters. And they aren't reacting to something I have said and done. They are reacting to having seen now for white people, melanemic people, for the first time in their lives, they got to see three months ago exactly what melanaceous people have been seeing happen to their people for the last 250 years. They got to see it. And then those young people are saying, enough, this is barn dirt and this has to be stopped. And they're protesting and they aren't protesting because they are sorry for people. They're protesting because they know that there is something grossly wrong with what's happening in this country today. And I hope that their numbers increase and I hope they don't stop until they get this thing turned around because the hope of the future is in the young people. Make no mistake about this. Old people are just gonna pass on and, and they're gonna go out as quietly as they can because they don't want somebody saying, we're taking away your social security. So they'll go along to get along because they don't have long to go. But these young people and the middle-aged people aren't gonna do it because they've got something to lose. They can lose their jobs, they can lose their image in the community. These young people have nothing to lose and everything to gain. They can be the ones who turn this thing around. The youth of today are going to be the adults and the and the managers and the bosses and the people who write the laws of the future and we'd better pray or if you don't pray we'd better hope or if you don't hope you better do whatever it has, whatever it takes to conv convince some higher power that what these young people are doing is absolutely right they need to protest the wrongness of what has been going on in this country particularly the last four years and they need to vote they need to vote well, thank you, Jane. Thank you so much for this conversation. I really appreciate all the different perspectives and the different kind of references that you've made. I think, um, you know, to your point about young people, you know, all of this starts prenatally, right? You had mentioned it earlier. Right. We often say at Erickson, the revolution will not be televised because it's going to start with infants and toddlers. And it's because of that, that we know that we have to tackle this early, well before children are brought into this world, we have to tackle it at the root. We all need to be soldiers in this particular work. We all have a role and a position to play. Otherwise, as you say, you know, there's so much at stake in terms of our humanity and our ability to thrive and ultimately live up to our greatest potential. So I thank you for all of- But wait, we, we have to stop with start with the mothers. We have to start with the mothers because they are the ones who are going to, while they're, hold, while they're carrying that child in their womb, they, they are going to say things that that child is going to hear. They're going to do things and feel things that are going to impact on that child. We have to start prenatally with mm -hmm. mothers telling their children and acting ways that their children will realize that their color is significant, but it does not determine their worth as human beings. We have to have mothers convinced 
that color is not what makes you a good or a bad person. Color is simply your body's reaction to the natural environment. And every child, every child is beautiful. Every single one of them. And with that, that's the last word. Thank you, Jane. I really appreciate it. Now that we've heard from Jane, let's bring in our panelists. We're gonna actually break this up into three different segments. The first segment, we're gonna explore how systemic racism manifests in the classroom experience. For that discussion, I've invited Rick Estrada, CEO and President of Metropolitan Family Services in Illinois, and Dr. Terrace Ross, who's the Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at the Leadership for Educational Equity in the Atlanta, Georgia area. The second panel is gonna explore the expulsion rates specifically for black males in early childhood and the impact of racism on social emotional development. For that discussion, I am pleased to have the Lieutenant Governor of Illinois, Juliana Stratton, and the Director of the Community Systems of Support at Illinois Action for Children, Grace Araya. For the last panel, we're gonna go deep into the early care and education workforce and specifically implicate the low wages and the high expectations and the fact that the majority of that workforce is women of color. For that discussion, Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton stays with me, and we also bring back Dr. Terrace Ross. Let's take a listen. Which doll is the nice doll? Which doll is the bad doll? Which doll is the nice doll? Which doll is the bad doll? And, what, and why is that doll pretty? Because she's white and he has two eyes. Which doll is the ugly doll? Why is that doll ugly? Because, he, because he's black. Which doll looks most like you? Like me? Yeah, which one looks like you? And that one. Okay. That doll. Yeah, that one. Which one? This one. Why do you want that skin color? Because... I don't know. I just... I don't know. Not sure? No. What do you think of that skin color? Well, it looks kind of whitish. And... That's all I remember. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Why, why do you want that skin color? Because it looks lighter than this kind, because this looks a lot like that one. Mm -hmm. yep. And I just don't like the way brown looks, because the way brown looks, looks really nasty for some reason, but I don't know what reason. That's all. So you think it looks nasty? Well, not really, but sometimes. Sometimes. And Brielle, they asked what color adults don't like. Do you remember what you said? Which one? That's right, that's what you said. Why do you think adults don't like that color? Dark. Dark. And adults, you think adults don't like dark? Well, maybe some adults do, but maybe some of them don't. Hmm. Cuál muñeco es malo? Un cono. Cuál muñeco es malo? Este. ¿Y por qué? Porque bueno, este es moreno y este blanco. Cuál muñeco es feo? ¿Por qué? Porque a mí no me gusta el color café. ¿Cuál muñeco te gusta más? Este. ¿Cuál muñeco es bueno? 
¿Y por qué? Porque no me dan miedo los güeros porque tengo más confianza con los, si los un poco más así como este. No tengo mucha confianza. ¿Cuál muñeco es malo? ¿Por qué? No sé. ¿Por qué el muñeco blanco es bueno? Porque sus ojos son azules y todo su cuerpo es blanco. So, Rick and Dr. Ross, um, thank you for kind of having this segment of the conversation. I'm curious, we just saw a clip on this doll experiment um, where it's really looking at how young children are responding and, and showing preference for certain dolls based on their skin color. What is your response um, to that specific experiment and the reaction and the responses of children. Let's start with you, Dr. Ross. Yeah, I have to say that as the mother of a seven-year-old black boy, that it was really painful to watch this. Um, and I'd heard about it, you know, it's, I think there's an older version and, and, and maybe the version I, that we were seeing is a little more recent. Um, and that just to see how much internalized racism and inferiority still exists and that lives inside of our children of color and the obvious emotional toll that you can see it's having on them, um, that they are acutely aware of prejudice and at that young age and that they know already what the world assumes and thinks about them without ever having met them and that none of those assumptions um, is represented by good or pretty. And so that just made it very painful to just sort of be reminded of how this isn't just an adult problem. This is something that our children feel they're aware of and it has an impact on them. And what about with uh, you, Rick? I mean, you have a long history in the early childhood space and heading up one of the largest providers um, in the city of Chicago. I'm just also curious about your reaction as well as that of um, your interpretation of the reaction of the children, knowing what this means in early childhood. Christina, it, it impacted me on multiple, multiple levels. Um, you know, first one, it, it's, it's just so disappointing. And so uh, it, it's painful, uh, as Dr. Ross said, to watch that video. Uh, primarily for me, um, because the children start off in that video happy and they're smiling. And once they're being asked the questions that make them reflect as to who they look most like, and, and the children were all of color, you could see the pain literally coming from their guts up to their face, uh, to the point where some of them look like they're about to break down in tears and just the faces they were making and which one, when the question was asked, which one is bad, you could see they were hesitating, but then they pointed all of them to the doll. And then when they asked, which one looks like you, then you see their faces drop. And this is the pain that our children are carrying all the time. And this is why it's so critical that in the early childhood sector, that our teachers um, go through training. And, and more importantly, that our teachers look like the children. But that's not enough because our teachers, even if they are of color, are also carrying that pain and maybe some of that bias. So it, it, it just made me reflect on how we as a system have to continue to be better. Absolutely. Um, I, speaking of, you know, thinking about how this plays out in the classroom, um, you know, from, both of your perspectives. Um, obviously, you know, Rick, you have an early childhood lens. And Dr. Ross, I know you do educational equity across, you know, the educational continuum. How does bias and institutional racism show up in classrooms? If you all can kind of expand on that. Let's start with you, Dr. Ross. Sure. Unfortunately, um, I think it shows up in so many forms from racially insensitive remarks that adults make to children to the way that we signal to children from an early age that white dominant culture is the norm 
uh, without taking the time to learn about, celebrate, elevate the diversity of students in those classrooms and their and what diverse backgrounds and cultures they come from. It shows up in the disproportionate suspension and expulsion rates among black and brown children, boys and girls. Uh, and it, it, when you compare them to, to white children, beginning at the preschool level. And so these are some of the ways that uh, it shows up. And I think some, are, some of this is gaining more attention. Um, a few years ago, we, it was the first time I really thought about the fact that preschool children were being suspended at all, but much less that black boys have a three times uh, or three times more likely to be suspended than white boys um, in preschool, um, no less. And so um, another way, and, and uh, Rick just alluded to, is that it shows up in the disproportionately white educator workforce. You know, I was looking at some research um, showing that virtually all white students, 99.7% of white students, attend school in districts where the faculty is as white as the student body, but only 7% of Black students and only 1 in 1,000 Latino students have that experience. And, and this is important because we know research has shown us that Black students, for example, are less likely to be suspended or expelled from school when they are taught by Black teachers compared to when they're taught by white teachers, even within the same school where you would expect the policies for discipline would be the same, but they're not always equitably administer. And, it, and then it's also important because research has shown us that teachers of color have higher expectations for children of color compared to white teachers. So as, as Rick was pointing out, just the fact that we need teachers that look like kids. Um, and then finally, that we see significant positive results when Black and Hispanic students have teachers who match their race and or ethnicity. And that can include, that ranges from attendance um, and school uh, fewer suspensions, more positive attitudes and behavior, higher test scores, graduation rates, and college attendance. So in a nutshell, representation matters for every, just about every educational outcome you can think of and at every level of education. Thank you. Rick? Yeah, uh, I mean, absolutely. And so, uh, Christina, I'm certainly known as an early childhood uh, professional but I'm on the board of the University of, of Illinois system. And so, and I um, found an elementary school taught at a high school. And so I think I have a pretty good perspective on, on all of education. And then you, but you see it, um, this bias at every single level. And um, let me just focus on higher ed for a second. And what I, um, constantly say to our leaders at the University of Illinois and hopefully some of them will be watching it's that you have to you have to see it to be it mm -hmm. going to be a leader in higher ed we need to have leadership in higher ed that looks like the students uh, because it goes beyond just what the content that you provide them it's it's their perception of the culture and the support that they're receiving and as Dr. Ross pointed out if you have people that look like the students at the college level or at the child uh, at the ch early childhood level, the likelihood that they will be treated more justly and fairly is, is higher, and uh, the likelihood that they will be uh, disciplined for minor infractions, whether at the early childhood or at the university level, is uh, lower, right? Because if you have people that look like them, and so it's important throughout the entire system, and uh, and that's what we're all working towards. Right. And I mean, you know, you all both speak to how representation matters, um, that children and young people see themselves in um, their educators and administrators and leadership. Um, but Dr. Ross, you also spoke to, you know, the institutional piece, you know, how there is a centering of white dominant culture in our educational system. And, and I think that that's a really important point because when we're thinking about this work, it's, it, it is happening at an individual level and an interpersonal level, but we can't forget that it's also baked into the system. And so how do we um, really begin to kind of disrupt as well as reimagine our systems um, to be more inclusive, to be centered on the lived experience of black children, of brown children, 
Um, and so I'm just kind of curious about your thoughts, if you can expand a little bit more on that specific point. I mean, you just said it and I, when we talk about centering on whiteness, um, something that gives me hope, um, more optimism, it, even in this crazy climate where we're battling a pandemic, uh, coronavirus, and a pandemic of racism in our country, is that um, for the first time in my life, I'm beginning to see white allies rise up and realize that this will not change if only black and brown faces are represented in the protesting and in the calls for um, equality and equity. And so same with education, um, the more awareness we bring to the teaching force, the leadership um, in, in K-12 education and, and higher, as Rick alluded to, even in the post-secondary space, the more awareness we bring through implicit bias training, uh, the more awareness we bring around in systemic racism and how we, we carry bias, implicit, unconscious, and some explicit, but that we carry it and how it affects us until we own that, we our children don't have a chance. But I am I am feeling hopeful. I am grabbing on to the to the hope I see in the streets, so to speak, of having more white allies join in this fight because it really won't happen with black and brown people alone because we've been dehumanized. Our children are, are perceived as being older than they are and less innocent compared to children at the same age, but that, who are white. And so you can't be a black and brown person marching and protesting and expect racism to go away because we are not always even viewed as human as being worthy of the investment. And so, yeah, this is, this is, you know, stronger together, all of the, yes, we can, all of the hope from, I think from the last, um, even presidential administration that encouraged us to be one America, encouraged us to fight together for injustice as opposed to pitting ourselves against each other. Right, and so, you know, thinking about both of your reflections on the doll experiment, and then also um, Jane Elliott's exercise with her third graders was, you know, really revealing in terms of how children internalize that treatment, um, that kind of social hierarchy, that tracking in a particular way. And you all have both alluded to, you know, the expulsion rate of black and brown children, particularly at the preschool level. I'm, also, I'm curious, Rick, because another arm of your work is, you know, violence interruption and is transformative in terms of young people really um, taking an approach to healing and taking an approach to resiliency within um, communities that specifically are challenged by violence. What are some of the long lasting impacts of bias and racism on child development and self-concept? Sure. Um, let me begin by maybe, uh, I, know, I know it's always dangerous by personalizing this a little bit, so um, in our family, a Latinx family, right, from uh, Mexico, um, whenever a child was born, and uh, Dr. Sayas, I think you've heard my story, this story before, is my grandmother would always ask us, you know, when we had, um, I'm one of five siblings and we have lots of cousins, but my grandmother would always ask us, so what color are the child's eyes? Mm. You know, as you go through that process, of hearing it multiple times, brown, abuela, grandma, cafes, they're brown. After a while, you know, you kind of, I love her to death, maybe my favorite person in the world, but it's getting tired of it. And I'm like, grandma, they're brown, just like mine. Are you gonna love her? And she's, she was like taken aback. Mm -hmm. Oh no, 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 mijo, son, that's not what I meant. You know, we carry this the rest of our lives, and 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 it's an example of the how deep white supremacy runs, or that the dominant culture runs, even in a different country. Mm -hmm. We also have issues with colorism mm -hmm. that runs deep. It's brought into the American context. It's then mixed in with the 
issues of race in this context, and then you have a new and evolving way of looking at race and colorism. Right on. Well, thank you both. Um, we're going to continue the conversation with uh, another clip and, and a topic. Um, there's, there's a lot to unpack here, and there's also a lot of action to take. And I appreciate you joining this conversation, and we'll check back in during the Q&A. Grace, I'm really excited to continue this conversation uh, with you, especially as the director of the Community Systems of Statewide Support for Illinois Action for Children, which is one of our largest advocacy and policy and programmatic organizations that focuses on young children in Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to kind of hear directly from you from that vantage point mm -hmm. um what are your what are your reactions to the data that you just saw yeah thank you christina uh, this is such an important conversation and i would say yeah the statistics are appalling right um expulsion is the most extreme act of teacher stigmatization right um, and the stigma really is a form of psychological violence right and it happens when teachers or administrators, right? They act in a way that excludes children um, from full group membership. That's essentially what's happening in successful group participation. Um, and that's directly in opposition to what our role is as educators, right? Which is really to support children and social emotional growth and development, right? They're still learning how to be, they're learning how to regulate themselves. They're learning how to express strong emotions in a way that doesn't hurt themselves or other people, right? So in this process of learning, they are bound to make mistakes and they're bound to show some challenging behavior, right? But that is our role as educators. And remember, we have to think long term. Really what we want at the end of the day is we want children to become citizens, right? That think intelligently, ethically, right? They know how to solve problems creatively and cooperatively. And when we expel children, we're really denying them that opportunity, right? Um, and so we're essentially causing harm. Right. And I mean, especially when we're looking at the the data and what we really see is that some of the manifestations of racism um, in terms of what Jane had been speaking to in the earlier segment can be easily found in our law enforcement and justice mm -hmm. systems. Right. Mm -hmm. And the statistics clearly illustrate that children of color and specifically black boys are disproportionately affected um, by these systems, these policies, these practices. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we begin to change this? How do we begin to chip away at this um, so that we don't see outcomes that essentially um, direct young children, young black, young brown boys to the law enforcement and justice system in starting in preschool that's right that's right um i think what's really interesting about all this is that expulsion is not based on children's behavior right it's an, it's an adult decision and when we look at all the factors that predict preschool expulsion it mainly has to do with teachers job stress it has to do with child teacher ratios it has to do with the length of days access to supports and so i think that's where we need to start when we think about what would really help to address this, right, um, is that we need to make sure that we're prohibiting suspension and expulsions across early childhood settings, right? Um, we know sometimes in public school settings or um, the publicly funded programs, we tend to see less of that because of supports that are put in place. And we know they're actually a lot higher um, in private schools 
or um, in some of the religious school settings. And so um, I would say starting with policy around that, but then also improving teacher preparation, right? Really with an eye towards cultural responsiveness and racial equity. That needs to be key and central in teacher preparation um, programs. But then also supports, right? We need to support teachers and programs by making sure we have early childhood mental health consultations and other support services. Um, and then lastly, I would say supporting a diverse teacher workforce, right? Um, we know part of the research is um, uh, with the whole implicit bias research shows that when teachers were given more information about the child's background or, or community, uh, what, what, what the research found is that teachers that share the same race as the children tended to be more empathetic, right? And that just really stems from sort of how our society has really been racialized, right? And so thinking about how do we diverse um, the teacher workforce, because we know there's a, a, a mismatch, right, between high rates, which tend to be black boys, and the early childhood workforce, which tends to be uh, white women. And so um, that's a huge piece. And then of course, promoting meaningful family engagement. For sure. And on that family engagement tip and thinking about your role in this statewide system of support for communities to kind of organize themselves and identify policy issues and implement innovative and nuanced programs and practices, what can you share about that work in Illinois, um, specifically to kind of get at this specific issue around expulsion, suspension, mental health in early childhood, um, and social emotional development? Yes. So in our work with early child collaborations across the state, we provide training and technical assistance, right? And so one of the things that we really emphasize is the need for parents and community members to be at the table, right? So if there's things happening in the community, it really needs to be driven by folks that live in that community. And so um, that is a struggle, right? So, because we've been used to sort of going with what our ideas are, we're the experts, but really making sure we're including parents, we're including families, um, in decisions. And so I think that does a lot to help inform, right, the decisions that are being made, even as it relates to who gets expelled, right, as it relates to what type of supports there are for the families, but as well as the teachers, right, because it's the parents that are experiencing directly when their child is being expelled, right? So that is just such a crucial piece. And then the other one is, you know, really using a racial equity lens um, in your work. Right. So thinking about, you know, how how do we get to where we are today? The outcomes that we're seeing. Right. We know there's uh, disproportionate amounts. We know that especially black boys are overly represented as it relates to expulsion. And so helping communities to take a look at data with that lens um, is really, really important. So you're not a part of perpetuating that in your community. Great. And I'm also, you know, wondering too, with respect to, you know, the um, early childhood mental health consultation, can you say a little bit more about that? Like what that looks like? You know, sometimes when you bring that up to people who are not in our field, they're like, what? Early childhood? Yeah. Well, they have mental health issues? Yeah. You know, if you can say a little bit more about that and how that also informs this particular issue. Sure. So we know in the classroom, children that show, um, that have challenging behaviors or that show strong needs, we know typically there's a lot of things sort of beyond that, right? Um, that, that, that show that the way it shows up and presents itself. We know there's trauma in the community. Um, and so what a mental health consultant will do is they'll work with a program, right? So when a teacher is noticing um, some behaviors in the classroom or the teacher may be sort of frustrated, you know, part of the first step, first step is to bring someone in. The mental health consultant can um, observe in the classroom, talk with the parents, service and support, but then also support the teachers, right? And strategies they may want to try, right? They may be doing some things that are not culturally appropriate, right? Sort of supporting them in that role. And so what it does is it supports the family, the teachers, and that program overall. So, um, you know, when people hear mental health, they tend to think about other things, but truly it's helping children um, develop, right? Social, emotionally, right? We want them to develop in a healthy way and, and contribute, uh, like we were talking about the citizens that we want later on in the future. Remember, we're developing those executive functions uh, in children. Right, no, and I mean, I think what I really appreciate about the 
mental health consultation model is it takes sort of like an ecological mm -hmm. approach, you know, thinking about the ecosystem the child is in and how specifically to support that ecosystem and as well as the actors within that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing about um, a teacher, an infant mental health consultant who came into a um, early childhood program and brought to the attention of the lead teacher how the way she was treating a particular boy in that classroom by constantly calling him out, by constantly mm -hmm. putting him under the microscope, mm -hmm. not only was that harmful to the child, but mm -hmm. what it was communicating to the other children was how to treat that child. That's right. And that's why those interactions and those relationships are so important mm -hmm. to, you know, have an opportunity to kind of self-reflect, have an opportunity to course correct, and right. ultimately go back to what you said, that these are adult decisions. Mm -hmm. Right. And I would add to that, like you were saying, children that display challenging behavior are the ones that need positive relationship with the teacher the most, right? But they're often the ones that are most difficult for teachers to accept and to like. Right, so that's that's where there's um, irony, right? And so and it does make them more vulnerable to further victimization, right? Not only by the teacher, but also by their peers act of stigma, you know, not wanting to be with that kid because they're bad, right? They don't listen. And so the child begins to grow up with that and internalizes that and it becomes mm -hmm. a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. So we, we wanna disrupt that, right? As early as possible, because we know that stigma tends to follow that child. And that's what really sets them up, right? For that preschool to prison pipeline, you know, that's really been used um, as a metaphor to kind of capture that process by which children, mainly black and brown children and low-income children, where they're pushed out of the school into the criminal justice system. So we want to um, intervene at the earliest that we possibly can and in the early childhood classroom is a place to do that. Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, thank you for joining us to continue this conversation, particularly about the disproportionate rate of preschool suspensions and expulsions as it relates to black and brown children, specifically boys. Now, you have been instrumental in your leadership in taking this issue and coming up with a very concrete solution during your time in the General Assembly. Can you walk us through the journey of that specific bill and how you were able to garner support and what sparked you to want to push it forward? Because as of last week in Illinois, we just finally got the final approval for the rules that have been promulgated with respect to this public act? Well, first of all, uh, I have been, I'm a restorative justice practitioner and advocate, and I've been working in the sort of justice reform space for much of my career and certainly made that something that I really wanted to focus on during my time in the Illinois uh, state legislature as a state representative. And uh, so I had been working on issues relating to high school and the school to prison pipeline. And what I came to find out by talking with some of the advocates in the early childhood space is that while I had been talking about a school to prison pipeline, I discovered that there was also really what I would say a preschool to prison pipeline that also had to be dismantled. And I learned very quickly uh, by looking at some of the data around how uh, where there were many children that through their behavior, they were considered sort of rambunctious and curious uh, for black and brown boys and increasingly black and brown girls, uh, they were looked at with a much harsher lens and really kind of looked at as troublemakers who talk too much. And they were being expelled from school from preschool. And uh, it was shocking to many people. And even now when I talk about it, people get just so surprised. What do you mean three and four year olds being expelled from preschool for what? But it's not really, uh, unfortunately, that shocking to me because uh, when we look at a sort of the systemic racism that we have seen throughout the educational system that has led to pushing out students of color led to harsher disciplinary practices. Uh, it was not surprising to me that our youngest children would also experience some of the, that, same, um, uh, that same type of harsh discipline as well. 
Absolutely. Lieutenant Governor, can you kind of explain, walk us through the strategies and the tactics that you employed as you were kind of moving this bill throughout the process? Because um, I'm particularly thinking about how did you build the public and the political will uh, to be able to see this bill cross the threshold? Well, I think first and foremost, I had to understand the data. And certainly from uh, my work with the Erickson Institute and other uh, early childhood uh, advocates and organizations, I came to understand more about why those first few years were so important. Those first 1100 days of life, those first three years where 85% of the brain development takes place and understanding that for everyone who talks about how we want young people to be on this path to productivity and to be successful and have every opportunity available to them, that if you are expelled in uh, preschool, that you have a much higher likelihood of dropping out of high school. So that's counterproductive. And I also recognize that, um, you know, that data shows that there are a lot of young people who have experienced and were living with trauma and then ultimately many of them toxic stress. And that uh, it, the response was not to then push them out of a caring environment, which is really supposed to be the place that can help to tend to some of those uh, essential needs that they have, uh, and to also support their family. It's to try to keep them in, not to push them out. And so the strategy was really to, first of all, learn as much as I could about the data, what happens with preschool expulsion, what happens to those children, what is the trajectory, what are the outcomes, but also to learn about what the impact is on families, families who often were called into the preschool to be told, I'm sorry, we can't keep your child here anymore. And now families who are working and need childcare or uh, early childhood programs were now left without in a lurch and without a, a real plan that impacted their ability to work. So the strategy was to work, uh, learn as much as I could to work with those who are already in that space early childhood organizations, uh, and then to, to, to bring some unlikely partners, uh, you know, to kind of talk about this issue to those who have been working in the justice space. I had been doing a lot of that work, but I don't think that people connected it to preschool expulsion. I don't think that there was this connection between the justice world and the early childhood space. And so I did a lot to combine uh, those two groups of those two advocacy groups and see how we could really build the momentum around this. And then finally, I talked to lots of legislators on both sides of, an aisle, on the, of the aisle, because as you know, early childhood education is not a partisan issue. It is something that everyone should and can care about and advocate for. And so I uh, spent a lot of time talking to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle and had some uh, bipartisan sponsorship of the bill to make sure that we made it clear that everyone should care about our youngest children and make sure that they have the best start in life. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Stratton. I really appreciated how your insights were able to kind of draw connections between early experiences and systemic racism. We were able to kind of highlight the need for supporting educators to help them reframe uh, child behavior. Also to understand that when it comes down to preschool suspension and expulsion, that is an adult decision. But ultimately that we need to be working towards supporting child development in all of our capacities. In this next transition, I wanna kind of help you draw the thread through uh, in looking at this video that we're gonna show that features a local community in Evanston and specifically the hopes the fears, the concerns, and how it underscores that in many ways the system puts a bullseye on Black children. And therefore, we need to be incredibly deliberate in how we work together as parents, as educators, as administrators, as a system, so that we can produce radically different outcomes for Black children. Let's take a look. We try to do things to help people. So I'm a peep person that like to help our young people. I don't want to see the jails full with young people. See, they got a double standard when it comes to the black kids, white kids. 
you mean to tell me that, uh, that the kid, the black kid, is that bad? He ain't that bad. He's tough. He's smart. The expulsion rate of black kids in preschool happening three times more than any other child is really starting this trend where it really sends a sign to how people look at our children from preschool all the way up and you're just like you already had a target on our backs from this young like it's unsettling of course because i'm raising a child and i don't know you know what situation it's it's finding the balance of how how to deal with that and um most importantly having a great relationship with your child so that they can be able to communicate what's going on um in preschool or you know whatever situation that they're in i want to see those next level students in college finishing high school being able to go after their dreams as an educator I approach it in collaborating with parents by first and foremost making sure that they know that I'm an ally and that I too am a victim as a woman of color and I hopefully inspire them to actively engage. There will be I know there will be bread to all when Jesus comes. Okay, it makes no mad difference what you say. I'm going down on my knees and pray. Thank you both for continuing this conversation. So far, we've had some uh, discussion between early childhood and systemic racism and how they kind of intersect. And for this part of the conversation, let's speak to the early care and education workforce. The predominant group of early care and education professionals are women of color, specifically Black, Latinx, Indigenous, immigrant women. And I'd like to talk about how the issues they face are really another manifestation of systemic racism and how it also connects to economic disparities. So let's start with you, Lieutenant Governor Stratton. I know we are working really hard in Illinois to lift up our early care and education professionals. And I'd like you to kind of speak to that a little bit more and expand on it. Well, First and foremost, we know that because early childhood uh, workers have historically been women of color, that throughout history, we know that society has often uh, devalued their skills and have paid these uh, workers less. And I think that what's really important and what we are recognizing here in Illinois is the importance to really acknowledge the professionalism of this field and make sure that we continue to create policies that help by um, uplifting and making sure that the wages uh, are really reflecting the work that has been done. Uh, we're working with industry stakeholders, nonprofits to develop grants and programs and incentives that can really work to increase wages and the potential for advancement uh, of early childhood workers. I wanted to just say that, you know, from the data that we see, there's a couple of things that I want to point out. First of all, that the average child care worker makes about $13 and 18 cents and often has no health care on the job. Uh, that makes them eligible for public aid, uh, for food and makes health care or access to health care really out of reach. 
And then school-based uh, preschool workers make closer to around $19 an hour. But again, many are black and brown women. Many of them are heads of households. And so they're also uh, eligible for public aid, food assistance, and not having any health care. So I think that this really relates to the need to really think about this sort of pipeline of qualified teachers and child care workers. Um, and it's really difficult to have that pipeline if people don't feel that, that, or if they see that inadequate wages are being paid uh, and not enough adequate compensation. And so that's something that we are thinking about. We, of course, raised the minimum wage here in Illinois as one effort to really just acknowledge that people deserve to have a livable wage. Um, but as we think about this field in particular, uh, it's important that we don't uh, get to a place where so many people are leaving the field uh, because they feel like if they're doing this work, that their professionalism is not being acknowledged or that they feel that they're going to be caught up in a cycle of poverty. So this is something that we are continuing to focus on. Uh, certainly Governor Pritzker is doing a great deal through his leadership to make sure that we prioritize early childhood education. He has been a leader, of course, in early childhood education across the nation. And to be um, concerned about early childhood education means that we have to be concerned about the people that are working in this field uh, that are disproportionately, uh, as we've already talked about, women of color. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I think the piece that you mentioned about professionalism is really key because the general public usually relegates this work to babysitting. And as you mentioned, there is a science behind it. And I also think that when we categorize it as babysitting, it sort of undervalues the work. And it doesn't escape me that, you know, we have to make these connections too, that it's predominantly women, women of color. And is it undervalued because it's women's work, because it's women of color? And so thinking about that from that equity standpoint, Dr. Ross, I'm curious if you can weigh in on this and what ways does the perception of the work play into the undervaluing of the work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and we're super focused on, um, on equity, right? So on um, dismantling systems of oppression and systemic racism and all of that. And I, I mean, of, of course, I would just echo um, everything that um, the Lieutenant Governor already shared around the devaluing of, the, of this uh, part of the workforce. Uh, and until we have an appreciation for the critical work that early childhood educators do um, to provide developmentally appropriate instruction to help children uh, develop uh, social skills and learn and practice those, then we'll continue to see a devaluation as well without more robust data uh, at the state and national level to collect and report out on the early childhood workforce it's easy for policymakers to ignore this segment of the population. I'm excited to hear about the things that Illinois um, is doing. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for sharing that. I'm calling from the Metro Atlanta area, so um, good to learn about what other states are doing. In terms of the sort of the connection of um, racism, systemic racism, and the early childhood workforce, I think we see that this issue is playing out in high definition right now um, as we've been battling the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, because you have to name the pandemics at this point. We've got a, a pandemic of racism, pandemic of coronavirus, you name it. Um, and we've been debating all summer and all spring about the need for parents to get back to work and how that seems to have taken the priority over the health and safety of our early care um, and early education um, educators. And now across all levels of education, you see that um, getting parents back to work has sort of been won out in this case. And so in the spring and in the summer, um, some of our early childhood education centers were the ones that were expected to stay open. And so this crisis and the fact that almost 40% of early child here child care workers are people of color and primarily women isn't a coincidence. Um, one of our lead members, Elliot Haspel, uh, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times just this summer on this issue. And he was quoting Myra Jones Taylor, who leads the uh, Zero to Three um, organization, is saying that the fact that a low wage sector so heavily made up of women of color is being asked to assume more risk by remaining open speaks to, to the quote, disposable nature of this work. 
And so there's really a, a reckoning point, I think. Um, and I don't know, people often credit, I think, Rahm Emanuel with this quote, um, never, never let a good um, crisis go to waste. So we're in the middle of a crisis. There are actually opportunities to actually lean into the need for more equity, including and especially um, pay equity. And I just would book in this by saying the history of childcare in America is itself tied to inequities based at least in part on race and that the first child care centers were founded by public charities to provide daycare for children of low income and single working mothers. And so this would have been during a time where the majority of those women uh, would disproportionately have been women of color. But now that more women have entered the workforce, the idea that these early learning centers are providing a critical and essential service to millions of families across all race um, and, and SES levels has not really seemed to caught, catch on um, or caught up in terms of a broad-based support for early child care workers earning a livable wage and getting um, needed health benefits. And so I think that the time is, you know, no better time than the present to really lean in and continue to advocate and push for this, um, including many of the examples that the Lieutenant Governor shared. I'm thinking about, you know, like the fact that you're bringing up the role that early care and education is playing in the pandemic and particularly the professionals behind it and the additional burden that they have. Um, and, and, and there is a moment right now where in many ways they're holding together our economy, our society. Um, and in, oftentimes when we relegate the work to babysitting, um, I think anybody who is home with their children um, you know, and working and managing all kinds of other things can certainly respect um, the, again, the science, the care, the art of, of this particular work. Um, I'm curious about, um, and, and let's start with you, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, how can, how can we use this moment to sort of change the misconceptions of early care and education and help lead the way in terms of how we elevate the profession to get the recognition it deserves as well as to ensure that they have the compensation and the benefits um, that they should be entitled to. Yes, well first and foremost let me say that I am one of those families. I mean we have a <laughs> four-year-old and we are at home working and trying to make sure that she has what she needs on a daily basis and it is not easy at all. Uh, and it's our duty, not just as policymakers, but just as caring human beings to really break that cycle of misunderstanding about early childhood care and the level of professionalism that is really brought to the field and to break this this uh, stereotype of it being babysitting because that's the last thing it is. You know, I, I really appreciate both of you framing it in this question about the COVID-19 pandemic and holding, uh, holding people together, holding our society together because all of us, all of us are under an inordinate amount of stress through this pandemic. And now you add that to a child who is feeling the energy from the family, the change in, in routine, and all of the other things that has that have had to happen for our youngest children. And then we think about these caring professionals who come in to hold them together and to make sure that they are loved and cared for and have what they need. So we know that the average person uh, is unaware of the level of expertise that goes into early childhood care. That's something that we have to change. We have to continue talking about it. Uh, there are so many people who are unaware of the way that many children, especially from marginalized communities or under-resourced communities, about why early childhood is so important. And so these are things that we have to continue to talk about. But at the same time, we also have to come back to the science and the data and what happens in those first 1100 days of life or those first three years when 85% of the brain development takes place and understanding what that means when you are shaping in those first three years of life, a young person's personality, you are uh, really influencing their natural gifts, 
by giving them uh, the activities that can help them to flourish and to really blossom in those gifts. You are developing their learning muscles and preparing them for the future. And really all the things that we say that we want for all for young people to be to grow up, to be productive, contributing members of society, so much of that depends on what's happening in those first years. And the fact that there's such a disconnect around that important level of work, and yet people still trying to relegate it to be considered as babysitting, means that somehow we have to do a better job of making sure that the general public understands why this is so important. And that then ties back to our previous conversation around wages and professionalism and making sure that those working in this industry uh, get the uh, compensation that, that, that they so deserve. So then you add, of course, to this um, kind of thinking about the added uh, needs for children who have either faced abuse or neglect or children who have faced housing insecurity or food insecurity or children from communities with high rates of violence or mass incarceration or the communities that we know that are far too often disproportionately communities of color that have suffered from decades of disinvestment. And you think about how many of those young children have experience trauma, quite frankly. And so you bring the expertise of these, uh, uh, those uh, men and women and disproportionately women who are working uh, in early childhood education, who are able to spot those areas of trauma very early on and work with the child, work with the family, uh, really to just make sure that those children get the resources that they need in a way that uh, tends to their emotional and cognitive need and really can make a difference around what the trajectory for that child might be. I mean, that's significant. So for someone to say, quote unquote, babysitter, to someone who has that level of influence, uh, we, so we have to keep sharing the science, keep sharing the data, and making sure that we keep talking about the impact that early childhood workers uh, have and adv advocate for better pay for them because they are shaping the future. And for me, I just wanna say, as the mother of a young one, a four-year-old, I wanna say thank you to early child workers, early child care workers all across the country who are doing such a phenomenal job in such trying and difficult times. No, here, here, I can totally, um, totally resonate with that <laughs> because it is, I mean, it's like you said, it's science, it's art, it's, it's a deep commitment and dedication to seeding the next generation. And, you know, this is precisely why we must take up this issue and lift it because it's another manifestation of systemic racism if we continue to allow early care and education workers to, to continually sacrifice themselves, their families, potentially their health. You know, the, the, the data you cited about how little they're making, you know, puts them on a trajectory in many ways to be eligible for public assistance or a lot of their benefits packages do not include health care. And especially when they're putting their lives on the line to serve essential workers, to care for children and potentially be exposed to COVID. And on top of that, because they are black and brown women, they, there's a higher prevalence of comorbidity. I mean, there's so many compounding factors and that's why precisely this is a really key issue in our field. So I, I thank you for those um, reflections and highlighting on that. Dr. Ross, is there anything you'd like to add from sort of a, your, your national purview perspective around that? That um, you know this this um, I was curious about this um, and I love I love to dig in deeper and I was just noticing um, the Center for Study of Child Care Employment is you know working to to bridge the the data gap and is tracking state policies and offers recommendations for what states can do um, and so some and, and, and the lieutenant lieutenant governor um, talked about like some way we need to communicate better to the general public and one of the things that that the um, that the center had lifted up was that among some cities and states that had made progress in this area around pay equity um, the messaging that they used was effective um, linking teacher compensation so pay um, equity or parity with the provision of a high quality learning 
environment, high quality instruction. So when the public hears like, you know, yes, we're gonna increase pay for preschool and early care um, um, educators, but that's because they're going to be providing early, um, high quality instruction in a high quality learning environment that resonates with families, it resonates with policymakers, it's something that people can get behind and that they also um, said that these um, cities and states were able to point to data on turnover in their states and leverage that messaging to say that's how we really need to recruit and retain skilled educators and if they're going to be skilled educators they must be paid a livable wage and so these are just some of the um, tips that um, I'm sort of gleaning from the research and so I commend all the work that you all are doing in Illinois um, and kudos thank you and I, I too say thank you on behalf of my seven-year-old and my husband um, to all of our educators but most certainly our early care Right on. Well, thank you, um, you know, for your thoughts and reflections. Um, we're going to continue the dialogue and looking at this from a whole nother angle. Um, so we'll, we'll be joining back for some further discussion during the Q&A. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back and thank you for staying with us, our audience who tuned in at 6 p.m. Central. Um, we invited everyone back from who you heard from earlier in the program for this live uh, Q&A segment. Um, we have over throughout the period of the hour and a half, we have taken your questions in the chat box and we are going to cycle them out and direct them to uh, our esteemed panel here. And to acquaint everybody, with who we have here. I'm gonna do some really quick introductions. First, starting with um, the woman of the night, Jane Elliott, whose work inspired this conversation as a lifelong <laughs> educator and disruptor of status quo in terms of how we tackle <laughs> racism. Uh, Grace Araya, who is the director of the Community Systems of Statewide Support from Illinois Action for Children, which is an initiative in partnership with the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development and the Illinois State Board of Education to equip communities with the tools and the resources and the skills and the support so that they can launch their own campaigns around early childhood policy to solve for the problems locally in their community. And we also have Dr. Terrace Ross, who's the Vice President of Policy and Advocacy from Leadership for Educational Equity in the Atlanta, Georgia area. It's an organization focused on building a pipeline of leaders anchored in equity and focused on policy and advocacy. And last, we have Lieutenant Governor Stratton, who's the 40th, or I'm sorry, 48th, Lieutenant Governor in the state of Illinois. She previously served in the Illinois State House of Representatives and her body of work is anchored in restorative justice as a practitioner and a conflict mediator. Welcome everyone. Um, really, oh, one more, one more. Not, ah, there you are, Rick. So good to see you. Rick Estrada, the president and CEO of the Metropolitan um, Family Services, which is one of Chicago's oldest and largest human service organizations in the area that focuses on early childhood, school age care, after school programs, violence intervention, prevention, and peace building. So here we have our esteemed panel. And let's kick off the first question with Lieutenant Governor Stratton. Um, given your background in restorative justice, Tell us a little bit about the Justice, Equity, and Opportunity Initiative in Illinois and how it connects to early childhood. Well, thank you first and foremost, uh, Christina, for that warm introduction and for moderating this important panel. I am so thrilled to be on this panel with such distinguished panelists. And I especially want to say to Jane Elliott, thank you for your leadership and for being such an inspiration to us all. To all who helped, all of the partner organizations who helped plan this uh, important conversation, as well as those who are joining the conversation, it is truly an honor. So uh, early on in our administration, and Governor Pritzker and I uh, took office in 2019, early in the administration, he uh, signed an executive order creating what's called the Justice, Equity, and Opportunity Initiative. And it really is a way to make sure that 
in the state of Illinois, as we think about all of our partner organizations and the agencies and departments of our administration, that equity is right at the very center of our work. What I always like to say is that justice is so much more than policing jails and prisons. Justice really encompasses every part of our lives and certainly over the last several months where we have seen calls for racial justice, not just throughout the state of Illinois, but across the country and really throughout the globe. Uh, I think it's really the foresight of our governor and our administration to say that we need to be talking about and being intentional about equity from the very beginning of the work that we did in our administration. Um, what I would say in terms of how it relates to early childhood education is, as I said, if justice is going to be about more than policing jails and prisons, and it's going to be things like housing and education and access to health care, it's also thinking about justice in terms of early childhood education. It means supporting the children and the families of those who have experienced and come in contact with the justice system, families that often have a level of generational incarceration, so to speak. We know that in the United States right now that studies show that there are nearly 3 million children whose parents are incarcerated. So we have to think about what does it mean from the earliest stages of life with so many people incarcerated, not just in the state of Illinois, but because of mass incarceration all around our country, uh, what kind of trauma are our youngest children experiencing because their parents are behind bars? So we know that they have issues with secure attachment when their caregivers are removed early on. We know that this can cause toxic stress and create issues with their developmental uh, and behavioral outcomes. And it also can have an impact on just the trajectory of their lives. So we are thinking about that very intentionally. We know that when we talk about equity, it must start at the very beginning. And that's what we're doing here in Illinois. Thank you for that um, explanation. That's really helpful and very concrete to think about how we can be deliberate in this work um, in government. The next question I have, um, because a lot of this was sort of um, spoken to in our discussions, our various one is actually for Jane, um, because Jane kind of put that challenge in, in her closing remarks. What can a parent do from the day they are born, when a child is born, to put their child on a path to lessen bias tendencies? Well, the first thing you can do is educate yourself. Every parent, every parent should get this book and read it because it's about the racial conditioning of our children and in it by, and it's by Nathan Rutstein from whom I got the statement, racial prejudice is an emotional commitment to ignorance. You have to educate yourself so that you realize that when you call your child black or white, you are using the wrong terminology. People don't come in black and white. They come in shades of brown. Every child has the right to see his or her skin color fairly and realistically represented. White and black are polar opposites. In the stories that those kids are gonna read in all those folk tales and all those fairy tales, white will represent goodness and purity and black will represent evil. As long as we are using those two words to separate people, that's how long we will be separated. We don't have to do that. We could show our children this and we could show this to every teacher and we could say, I want this on the wall of every classroom that my child goes to school in. I want my child to see that there are many different shades of brown and my child is one of those shades. There isn't a white or a black child represented on this page. This came out of the National Geographic magazine for April of 2018. Everybody, everybody should get that magazine, read that magazine and then get the Pantone color wheel insist that it be put on the wall of the classroom right beside that ridiculous Mercator map and have the children put their hand up against that color wheel and find the color of their skin. You will not find a child who will put his hand up and find a color, a skin that is this color. There are no people this color in the United States of America. Get over it. Words are the most powerful weapon devised by humankind. We have used the words white and black to keep people separated and to keep some people good people saintly people on top and those others who are of that black group on the bottom. It's time to get rid of that. Words hurt people every single day. Educators know that. I don't know why they are still agreeing to go along with this idiocy. 
Thank you. And and to to kind of draw that line to the educators, this next question is okay. Indeed, Have you lost? <laughs> indeed, we are we are we are with you, and we agree with all of all of that you laid out. And and speaking about educators, we're going to draw that line to them. The next question is for Dr. Ross. How are we going to best educate the educators, as Jane uh, mentioned in her remarks earlier? Where do we begin? You know, is it the coursework for educators that address racism? I mean, how do we go about this work? Yeah, uh, I'm a believer in um, in district and statewide adoption and implementation of implicit bias training. We have to raise awareness about unconscious biases and really begin to equip teachers and their school leaders with the right tools to address this in the classrooms, in themselves, in their peers, and in the larger school community. You know, Jane has done, well, she's prolific. Everyone knows Jane's work. But even on this call tonight, she has raised awareness, right? Among the, we're the choir. She's preaching to the choir, but she still raised our awareness about a lot of these issues and, and really caused us to think more deeply about them. And so it really does begin with conscious raising and, and awareness. And so um, state adoption and implementation of positive behavioral interventions that support teaching kids how to um, manage their emotions, how, how to teach uh, educators how to not attach, someone said in the chat earlier tonight, maladaptive um, you know, approaches to what they see in, in black and brown, well, brown, you know, darker shades of brown children to use Jane's language. But Thank then you. also that I think is super important that after we, you know, celebrate the win that we've passed a policy, something has gone in the direction that we think is toward equity, that we really monitor how well and um, our educators, practitioners are, are implementing some of these um, approaches, because if, if there's not fidelity to that, then we can find often that critics will, will take hold and begin to um, you know, question and, and sort of detract from the positive uh, movement that we've made. Thank you. And, and you know, speaking of that bias piece, um, the next question I wanna direct to Grace, how can educators help children respond to acts of bias in the classroom? A really good question. So I would say um, I would approach it not even from the response, but that teachers really um, understand that they should be proactive, right? So don't wait for incidents to happen in your classroom. Be proactive. Understand, like we've been talking about today, that we've all been racialized, right? Because of the society that we live in. As we saw from those videos, children are already coming into your classroom with ideas, right? And value being attributed to individuals based on the color of their skin. So know that that's what children are coming in with in your classroom and be proactive about it, whether it's the books that you're reading in the classroom. Are you, what, what sorts of things are you doing in the classroom to make sure that each individual child sees themselves in that classroom, right? That they're worthy, they see their culture represented, right? And so be proactive in developing all those things. And the other thing I would say is also, you know, sometimes early childhood educators, they shy away when children notice differences in other children, but I would say, um, to not do that, right? If, if you notice that someone's hair is different, right? My hair is curly or they notice that or someone's skin is darker. Yes, we notice all the differences, but what we don't want children to do is to attribute value to those differences, right? I'm more valuable because of my skin color or less valuable um, because of my skin color. Um, and then other things I would say in terms of responding is what we, what we know is developmentally appropriate practice in early childhood, right? Helping children to um, understand empathy, right? To really develop their sense of empathy. Um, when they come into, they have an issue or a problem with another child, what are you doing to help them problem solve, right? Are you using different strategies such as a peace table? What are you doing to help them manage their emotions? Because likely they're acting out and they've seen adults call a child, call someone else something, you know? And so these are, they're just, acting out what they've seen and heard. And so knowing that, giving them other ways where they can express their emotion, whether it's anger or frustration, or maybe it's their own insecurity and they may help them to feel a bit su superior if they call a child a certain name. And so being really mindful of child development, but then being really proactive um, in your approaches in the classroom, I would say. Great, thank you. And, and, and also thinking about, again, from the educators, um, perspective. We, we talked about all the disparities and we talked about the, 
the low wages, the high expectations, there's a high turnover rate in, in early childhood. And, you know, Rick, because you are an employer of the um, early childhood uh, professional workforce, what are some ideas that you have to attract um, educators and other professionals into the early childhood space? Well, I, you know, some of the ideas you're not going to like, I think, Christina, but, uh, but other ideas are simple, right? We're going to increase the salary of our early childhood workforce as a, uh, as a society. And we're, you know, we're among the top payers in that area already, but certainly it's not enough. But here's some of the other ideas I have. Uh, it's, it goes against, uh, I think, what some of the universities are doing. I think we, in some ways, uh, for the sake of professionalizing the field, we are over-credentialing the field. And I think if you look at it from a different perspective, it could be seen, seen as a form of discrimination and racism, that we are going to continue to raise the level of education to exclude a bunch of teachers that otherwise are doing a great job and getting great mentorship, but now we're going to exclude them because they don't have the credentials that we have deemed as a city and as a state necessary. So, so that was the part that I think the universities don't like, but um, you know, the teachers that we do have, we have to value and we have to pay them more and we have to work with the state, city, county and others to help us do that. Absolutely, I mean, there's an imperative because you think about the contribution that early care and education professionals are making to society and it certainly is not commensurate with the compensation and benefits. And in fact, we are asking them to sacrifice at the expense of this particular profession. And that's just not a good dynamic. I'm, I'm curious because, you know, we're, we're talking about action tonight. This was discussion, this was a conversation, um, but ultimately we want to compel people to act. Um, let's, let's begin to kind of wind down the conversation um, with each of you offering to our audience, what's one thing they can do uh, tonight to take action, to join the movement in terms of eradicating systemic racism and white supremacy starting in early childhood. Let's start with you, Jane. <laughs> Once again, educate yourself about those children, educate yourself about the cultures that those children come from, realize that the white culture isn't the only right culture and that these kids all have, all, many of them come from homes that are rich and wonderful and beautiful, but only in their parents' eyes and in their eyes. Do nothing to do nothing to give those kids the idea that there's only one right way and that's the white way. For heaven's sakes, let's start take, talking about the fact that when that school bus stops at that red light, that that red light was invented by a, a black man. When they put their shoes on in the morning, the last for creating those, for shoeing, sewing those shoes together mechanically was invented by a black man. Lead them through all the wonderful things, all, all week long, all day, have pictures and names and here's a set of shoes you wouldn't have them if it hadn't been for a black man. Let's recognize the wonderful things that people of color, the wonderful contributions that they have made to education with these little kids. They aren't too young to know this. They know what Santa Claus looks like and they should know what these valuable inventions look like and what their inventors look like. It's, kids remember things from this. From, I can remember what I learned in first grade and I didn't learn much, but I can remember what I learned. These kids learn from the minute they're in that classroom. They are learning things without you even intending to just by looking around the room. And that room should be a, a mess of wonderful things that we have because of the contributions of people who are other than tall, white males. Thank you, Jane. Grace, one thing, one action people can take tonight. I would say it's to- I've lost um, you, okay. To commit to being um, an anti-racist, to interrogate your own thinking. We all have our circle of influence, so start there. Um, and then be committed to adopting a racial equity lens in your work and hold your organization or wherever you have a fear of influence to adopt a racial equity lens. All right, Rick, your one offering for the audience tonight? Yeah, to uh, follow on the um, coattails of Jane to jettison the false notion of race. It is a lie. It's no, you know, it's, it's a human made construct. It's a lie, jettison it. Dr. Ross, you're offering this right. evening? 
Yes, I would say plus one to everything that's been said, but then I'd also add, um, if you're uh, a member of the white or to borrow Jane's term, melanemic that I learned tonight, if you're a member of the melanemic community, do not put the onus <laughs> on marginalized communities. Do not put the onus on marginalized communities, darker shades of brown people to do the heavy lifting of educating you about um, racism and, and systemic oppression and all of these things. Don't put the onus on uh, brown people to right the wrongs and educate their peers. Please do the work. Um, ask helpful questions, but take up the torch of, 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 of educating yourself about some of these issues. Thank you. And Lieutenant Governor, you bring us home with the one action we can do tonight leaving this discussion. Well, I'm gonna kind of combine it into two because I wanna piggyback off of what's been said, but I wanna specifically, you know, Terrace talked about not putting the onus on communities of color to have to be the ones to educate and answer every question and to really carry the burden of this work. At the same time, I will build off of that and say, do this work when you talk about how do you make sure you educate and how do you make sure that your environments are culturally appropriate make sure that you are talking to those communities as well. Don't just decide this is what it should look like when you're educating uh, young people. You can make sure that you are including the voices of those communities, not as the ones who have to carry the burdens, but to input their voice and to make sure that you are checking in to say, are we on the right track? That's not something that should be decided independently. And the other thing that I would say is just get started. You know, I know that there are a lot of conversations that are taking place and everyone is worried, well, what if I don't do it the right way? Well, I can tell you getting started, learning, picking up the books, some have been, you know, you, there's been lots of conversation today, lots of recommendations and resources. Get started with that work. That's what's important with action. Here in Illinois, we brought together uh, I worked with the uh, Cook County Board President and the mayor of the city of Chicago, and we came together and did a full forum around putting a racial equity lens right in the center of how we will think through government. And that's not something that's been done in government before. We don't know all the answers of what it looks like and how it's going to all turn out. But what we didn't do is just sit down and keep talking about it. We didn't just sit in rooms and say, oh, don't you wish one day we can get started with this work? We put something together, we have people engaged in the work and we are moving forward. So that's what I would say about action. You had a lot of ideas in today's conversation. Now it's time to do the work. And is it always gonna be easy? No, it will not. But what's important is that we don't allow the status quo to just continue because the status quo harms our children and all of us should be committed if nothing else to not causing our children any harm. Great, thank you. And with that, that is the last word. I'd like to thank all of the panelists this evening for sharing your insight, your expertise, and most importantly, your commitment to the work. And thank everyone for listening. And we are going to transition to the next closing segment. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Grace Araya and I work for Illinois Action for Children. I had the good fortune of calling Maria Whelan our president and CEO, and I've been asked to share a few thoughts about our beloved leader. As you may already know, on June 10th, we lost our fierce leader, Maria, unexpectedly. We lost a mentor, a friend, and a colleague. She was a fierce and tireless advocate for young children and their families, a giant in the early childhood field. Although she had this bigger than life personality, 
What struck me most was her ability to make everyone feel seen and heard. This was evident in the days following her passing when Illinois Action for Children held space for staff throughout the organization to share a memory about Maria. And almost everyone talked about how they felt that she truly wanted to know them and their story. We are grateful for Maria's leadership and advocacy for our youngest learners and her relentless support for early childhood education. We're also thankful that she had the vision and leadership to value the importance of families and communities in early childhood and in helping children learn and grow. My last interaction with Maria was the Friday before her passing during our all agency meeting where Maria said, the issues raised around equity resonate with me more than ever. I am struck with how far we have to go. I am struck with the obscenity and poverty and inequity, and I'm most struck by the lack of moral and strategic leadership. We all need to take time to learn and to take collective action. Maria's words then couldn't have been more poignant today, and she will be deeply missed. We'd like to now share a video with you so you can hear from Maria directly. Hello, this is Maria Whelan, President and CEO at Illinois Action for Children. I hope everyone's doing well and having a fabulous day. I don't think we understood how much of a barrier deep, deep poverty is in terms of engaging families and, and creating opportunities. For Almost two thirds of the three and four year olds in these very, very poor communities have no access to classroom based preschool, Head Start, or child care programs. The kids who need it the most. The kids who need it the most. Thank you for all that you do each and every day to advance our mission, to be a catalyst for organizing, supporting, and developing strong families in powerful communities where children matter most. I hope that all of you know how much the work matters. Maria would have been with us had we had this event in April. She was going to facilitate the event for us and speak on advocacy and action steps that we could take together as a nation and within our own local communities. In the words of Maria, every action can change a life. Thank you for celebrating Maria Whelan. Thank you again for joining us this evening for the conversation. We hope that it invoked some thought, perhaps some emotions, but most importantly, that it inspires you to act. One thing that you'll notice about our panelists this evening is that their work isn't just a singular act or event. It represents a discipline and a body of work. And specifically, they invite so many others into their work to understand how early childhood and systemic racism intersect and how we all have a responsibility for solving for that problem. This is precisely why we are inviting you to take that conversation, as well as the action items we just listed, to your kitchen table, to your workplace, and most importantly, to your community. The road ahead is long and challenging, but all of us have a social responsibility to be a part of that solution. I'd like to acknowledge our conveners this evening. The Evanston Early Childhood Council, the Evanston Community Foundation, the Niles Township Early Childhood Alliance, and Erickson Institute. We'd like you to know that if you made a donation this evening, every single dollar is gonna to go to early care and education professionals, as well as families. That's just one small step towards ensuring that young children have a great start at life. But most importantly, in this process and in this campaign to eradicate systemic racism starting in early childhood, it requires action. And it specifically requires your action. So join us in that movement. And thank you once again. <laughs>